So Jay Baba, everyone. Um, hey, Ralph Stone, glad to have you here. Um, <clears throat> well, we've um, we continually return to our favorite poets, Hafez and Rumi, because they just have no parallel. Um, I hope that it's um, still as interesting to you all as it is to me. I um, more than once have been reading either Hafez or Rumi and literally fallen into a state of ecstasy. It has that effect on people. And um, I know a lot of us think that <clears throat> Reading poetry is superfluous, kind of like me wanting to buy a 1950s Ford pickup truck. But I think there's something very essential about it. And there are a lot of cultures that, that think of it as an essential act. And I think we would, we would, we would benefit from <clears throat> integrating it into our daily routine more. It's a way of really transcending all of the struggles that people are going through. And I wanna just start by sharing this story. Now we've talked a little bit about the history of, of Rumi and how he met Shams. And um, I just wanna share this little bit about Rumi and the act of listening and the act of, and the act of silence, of being in silence. So when Shams met Rumi, he gave him a series of challenges and I'm just going to read from um, this lovely, it's just a new translation. It's called Gold. We've read from it one other time. It's an American woman who, who, who reads and speaks Farsi. Her name's Halel Liza, Liza, sorry, Liza Gafuri. And this is her book. It's, it's fabulous. It's very different from Coleman Barks, who was, you know, the primary Rumi translator. But she had a little preface, and here's what it says. Shams set Rumi an array of challenges. He demanded that Rumi put all books aside and quit reciting passages from scripture, literature, and folk tales. Where is your own voice? Answer me in your own voice, Shams insisted. On one occasion, Shams ordered Rumi to buy a jug of wine, which good Muslims were expected to shun and to carry it home in plain sight. If Rumi was to be liberated from the shackles of convention, he needed to let go of his good name. Shams also introduced Rumi to the practice of Sama, or deep listening. Conventionally understood, Sama referred to the practice of listening to a book read aloud with a goal not only of acquiring knowledge, but also of strengthening conversation and concentration. For him, the objects of attention was not scholarly texts, but music and poetry, which he saw as a means of arriving at mystical trance, revelation, ecstasy, and divine intoxication. Shams and Rumi kept company with musicians and spent countless hours listening to music. It was an act of defiance in a conservative religious authority regime for whom music, apart from singing passages from the Quran, was at best distraction and at worst a sin. Sama also came to mean the whirling dance, a demanding and joyous devotional practice to which Shams introduced Rumi. In Sama, the dancer whirls counterclockwise or clockwise around the axis of the left or right leg, turning forever towards the heart. In this case, turning left towards the heart and turning and, and when <clears throat> people who can see energy look at cells, they and scientists have actually confirmed this, cells that are, are sick are actually turning counterclockwise. Cells that are healthy are, are, are turning clockwise. Native people, when they go into ceremony, go in clockwise, they come out counterclockwise. One's, one's receiving and one's giving. Over the course of two years, Shams broke Rumi open when outraged former disciples succeeded in driving the dervish from town, Rumi was devastated. This is when he composed his first poems, Love Letters to the Absent Shams, who on receiving them returned. From that point on, Rumi would compose poems while sometimes whirling to drums as friends wrote down his words. The sober preacher had become an ecstatic poet. I wanted to mention that because Rumi talks a lot about silence. And one of the things I've really noticed about silence is that um, 
<clears throat> in order for silence to be a pregnant silence, a rich silence, a full silence, there has to be a conversation happening somewhere in the unseen world. And so it occurred to me when I was thinking about how much Rumi talks about silence that he had to be, <clears throat> this whole notion of listening had to somehow be a precursor to this, to this deep, intimate connection with, with silence. So this is what Coleman Barks talks about in Rumi, Bridge to the Soul. <clears throat> Rumi's name, you know, sort of means bridge, actually. Rumi devotee, devotes a lot of attention to silence, especially at the end of the poems where he gives the words back into the silence they come from. It is truly one of the mysteries that flows through his work. He was once asked, isn't it strange that you talk so much about silence? He answered, the radiant one inside me has never said a word. Here are some closing lines from his collection that include the silence after the poem as an integral part of that poem. And he just quotes a few in lines. One of them is, now, now let silence speak. As that begins, we will actually start. Another one is, now the kissing is over. Fold your love in. Hide it like pastry filling. Whisper within with a shy girl's tenderness. Another one, music begins. Your silence deepen that. Were you to put words with this, we would not survive the song. This is pure silence, not the kind that happens when living dogs are eating a dead one. Be clear or like a mirror reflecting nothing. Be clean of pictures and the worry that comes with images. Gaze into what is not ashamed or afraid of any truth. Contain all human faces in your own without any judgment of them. Be pure emptiness. What is inside that, you ask? Silence is all I can say. So I want to say that I wanted to open with silence, partly because, you know, next month will be um, Silence Day, which I love participating in. Um, but also, it seems to me that a lot of a lot of times we struggle a little bit to apprehend poetry or to really take it in and comprehend it. And I think sitting in that silence and listening for the silence can really assist us in weaving our understanding around poetry, which is really designed to make us feel something rather than, than so much, you know, for a thought. It's one of the things that I, that I love so much about it. It sort of bypasses the brain in a lot of ways. So there's a lot we could say about that. Um, for about a year and a half, I had a practice of, of holding Sabbath. And for me, that meant picking a day. It was usually Saturday, actually, but it could have been Sunday, where I charged myself to to not to not clean anything to do to do no shopping and to do no work and I can only do them if I felt like it would enhance my soul's joy and it forced me to and also no no emails it forced me to imbibe in the world in a different way and to really do only that which was rejuvenating for me and it was extremely was an extremely beautiful practice that I feel like is sort of what he's talking about here. <clears throat> and since Baba gave us such a beautiful example of what that means to honor silence, I just wanted to, to share that. I'm just gonna dive in and start reading some poetry. And does anybody, did anyone bring a favorite Rumi poem that they would like to, to share? Terry, I know you have one. So I'm just going to dive in and, you know, give me a signal if you'd like to read something. Um, this one is called A Bowl Fallen from the Roof. 
you that give new life to this planet, you that transcend logic, come. I'm only an arrow. Fill your bow with me and let fly. Because of this love for you, my bowl has fallen from the roof. Put down a ladder and collect the pieces. People ask, but which roof is your roof? I answer, wherever the soul came from and wherever it goes at night, my roof is in that direction. From wherever spring arrives to heal the ground, from wherever searching rises in a human being, the looking itself is a trace of what we are looking for. But we have been more like the man who sits on his donkey and asks the donkey where to go. Be quiet now and wait. It may be that the ocean one, the one we desire so to move into and become, desires us out here on land a little longer, going into our sundry roads to the shore. If anybody wants to make a comment or hear it again, just say so. I could hear it again. Yeah, me too. I, I also want to know why you chose that as your number one. Because it was the first poem in this book. <laughs> I love the logic. You that give new life to this planet, you that transcend logic, come. I am only an arrow. Fill your bow with me and let fly. Because of this love for you, my bowl has fallen from the roof. Put down a ladder and collect the pieces. People ask, but which roof is your roof? I answer, wherever the soul came from and wherever it goes at night, my roof is in that direction. From wherever spring arrives to heal the ground, from wherever searching rises in a human being, the looking itself is a trace of what we are looking for. But we have been more like the man who sits on his donkey and asks the donkey where to go. Be quiet now and wait. It may be that the ocean one, the one we desire, so to move into and become desires us out here on land a little longer, going our sundry roads to the shore. It is time for us to join the line of your mad men all chained together. Time to be totally free and estranged. Time to give up our souls, to set fire to structure and to run out in the street. Time to ferment. How else can we leave the world vat and go straight to the lip? We must die to become true human beings. We must turn completely upside down like a comb in the top of a beautiful woman's hair. Spread out your wings as a tree lifts into the orchard. A seed scattered on the road. A stone melting to wax. Candle becoming moth. On the chessboard, a king is blessed again with his queen. With our faces so close to the love mirror, we must not breathe, but rather change to a cleared place where a building was and feel the treasure hiding in us. With no beginning or end, we live in lovers as a story they know. If you will be the key, we will tumble in the lock.
a sweet voice calls out, the caravan from Egypt is here. A hundred camels with amazing treasure, midnight, a candle and someone quietly waking me. Your friend has come. I spring out of my body, put a ladder on the roof and climb up to see if it's true. Suddenly there is a world within this world, ocean inside the water jar. The king sitting with me dressed as a servant, a garden in the chest of a gardener. I see how love has thoughts and that these thoughts are circling in conversation with majesty. Let me keep opening this moment like a dead body reviving. Shams of Tabriz saw the placeless one, and from that he made a place. I'm going to read it again. A sweet voice calls out The caravan from Egypt was here, a hundred camels with amazing treasure. Midnight, a candle, and someone quietly waking me. Your friend has come. I spring out of my body, put a ladder to the roof, and climb up to see if it's true. Suddenly there is a world within this world, an ocean inside the water jar. A king sitting with me, dressed as a servant. A garden in the chest of a gardener. I see how love has thoughts, and that these thoughts are circling in conversation with majesty. Let me keep opening this moment like a dead body reviving. Shams of Tabriz saw the placeless one, and from that, he made a place. Why does the soul not fly when it hears the call? Why does a fish gasping on land but near the water not move back into the ocean? What keeps us from joining the dance the dust particles do? Look at their subtle motions in sunlight. We are out of our cages with our wings spread, but we do not lift off. We keep collecting rocks and broken bits of pottery like children pretending they are merchants. We should split the sack of this culture and stick our heads out. Look around, leave your childhood. Reach your right hand up and take this book from the air. A voice speaks to your clarity. Move into the moments of your death. Consider what you truly want. Now, call out commands yourself. You are the king. Phrase your question and expect the grace of an answer. I'm going to read it again. Why does a soul not fly when it hears the call? Why does a fish gasping on land but near the water not move back into the sea? What keeps us from joining the dance that the dust particles do? Look at their subtle motions in sunlight. We are out of our cages with our wings spread, yet we do not lift off. We keep collecting rocks and broken bits of pottery like children pretending they are merchants. We should split the sack of this culture and stick our heads out. Look around, leave your childhood, reach your right hand up and take this book from the air. A voice speaks to your clarity. Move into the moment of your death. Consider what you truly want. Now, Call out commands yourself. You are the king. Phrase your questions and expect the grace of an answer.
Hey, Trace. Yeah. So which edition of his poetry is that? This is called Remy Bridge the Soul. Um, okay, okay. Bridge to the Soul. Good. Wow. It's a small, it's a small collection. Um, mm -hmm. But I've just really, in, I've really enjoyed it. I've noticed that, you know, he has several books out. I think he has seven or eight books out. And I've noticed that each one really has a different flavor to it. Mm. I see the face that was my home. My loving says, I will let go of everything for that. My soul begins to keep rhythm as if music is playing. My reason says, what do you call this cypress energy that straightens what was bent down? All things change in this presence. Armenians and Turks no longer know which is which. Soul keeps unfolding inward. The body leaves the body. A wealth you cannot imagine flows through you. Do not consider what strangers say. You can be secluded in your secret heart house, that bowl of silence. Talking, no matter how humble seeming, is really a kind of bragging. Let silence be the art you practice. He's referring to the Armenian Turkish war that um, you know was really the largest genocide um, in the 20th century outside of World War II. That's why we had so many Armenian people living in the United States and Canada. They were driven out of their home by Turkish Turkish people. It was a Muslim cleansing, unfortunately, which he witnessed. I didn't realize it until recently, but um, you know, Rumi was alive um, really when the, the Crusades were happening and um, Muslims and Christians were at, at war with each other. So it was even more, um, I think, critical that he bridged those worlds. Um, you know, when, when he died, major representatives of every religion came to his funeral because he exemplified so um, intrinsically um, a love for all, all religions. He actually married a Christian woman, which he was the head of a Sufi monastery. So he really, um, you know, practiced what he preached. It was unheard of for people to do that. I'm going to read some of these um, poems from Gold, which I think are so lovely. I think this is, this is the newest translation I have found of Rumi that I have really loved. Um, and it's interesting to note when you are looking at the translator's work that um, Coleman Barks tends to. Ah, he tends to really write um, in sort of a stream of, almost like a stream of conscious way. Some of these poems are actually laid out as poems, but often they look more like prose poems. This is kind of common for Coleman Barks to write this way or to write in a, in a prose style because, you know, Rumi actually did not write down most of his work. Someone else wrote it down. It was really a stream of consciousness spoken, spoken out loud. But um, she really does follow a poetic form in her in, in the way she lays it out. But I guess that's the translator's prerogative um, since he spoke it and didn't have any line breaks. <clears throat> Open your eyes to the four streams flowing through you. Pay no attention to what gossips say. 
They call the wide-eyed flower jasmine. They call the wide-eyed flower a thorn. The wide-eyed flower doesn't care what they call it. I adore that freedom. I bow to it. Some say you worship fire. Some say you follow scripture. What do they know? Labels blind and tear us apart. Your eyes are not a vulture's beak. See through the beloved's eyes. See one when your mind says two. The angels adore your love drunk eyes. Open them and dismiss the vicious judge from the post you gave him. Bow to a human and greet the angel. Let love, the water of life, flow through our veins. Let a love drunk mirror steeped in the wine of dawn translate night. You who pour the wine, put the cup of oneness in my hand and let me drink from it until I cannot imagine separation. Love, you are the archer. My mind is your prey. Carry my heart and make my existence your bullseye. It's not that the lion battling an enemy, no, I'm not that lion battling an enemy, confronting myself keeps me busy enough. I am the soil, love seeds. Roses and lilies bloom from this mud. I ached from separation. I cloaked myself in night, emerged a shining moon. Consumed in love's fire, I slip through any opening. Arise like smoke. I am a child. Love is my teacher, waking me from ignorance. Like love, I will live on, radiant, eternal, when eating and sleeping are done. Till then, like a master musician, I quiet my mind and listen. I fast. In silence, we hear body becomes spirit. You leading the caravan, look at your camels head to tail, all of them, drunk. The king is drunk, the captain is drunk. Friends and strangers, they're all drunk. Gardeners, listen. Thunder beats a drum. Clouds pour the wine. The garden is drunk, the meadow is drunk, the buds and thorns are drunk. Whirling sky, watch how the elements whirl. Water is drunk, air is drunk, earth and fire are drunk. Don't even ask about the unseen or the mysteries of eternity. They are the drunkest of all. Liberate yourself from tyranny of self. Be humble as soil, and you will see every particle of soil is drunk on love by the creator's design. In winter, the garden, the roots of trees, secretly sip wine. You have a jug of love's wine? Pour it for all in equal measure. There's been enough brawling. Friends, enemies, admit it or deny it. They're all drunk, whirling at the core. Keep pouring, loosen the knots. Only a head steeped in the wine of love will tear off the turbans and the crown. Pour the reddest wine for the ill and the ailing. Let their sallow faces flush with fire. Let them burn with love. God's wine is light and delicate. You can drink countless jugs. 
Shams of Tabriz, in your presence, no one is sober, infidel and believer, aesthetic and winemaker. They're all drunk on love, whirling and whirling and whirling through. Hmm. Recently I had this experience, someone came to me and she um, was fighting something rather intense and um, she shared it with me. It was almost like she was going through a dark night of the soul kind of battle. And it really kind of scared me how intense it was for her. It really, you know, caused me to uh, fear for her safety. And um, I found myself um, carrying that battle in, in myself a little bit out of compassion for her. And I thought, well, that's, that's not helpful you know, for me to do that. But there I was carrying it, you know, that's what I had sort of invited it in to carry. And um, I didn't know how to let it go. And so I just started to pray about it. And um, the response that I got was to be basked in, in love. And at first I didn't know where it was coming from. I, I thought this is just, you know, what gr grace has descended upon me. And um, when I reflected a little bit on that extremely intense experience of, of being connected to a love that was greater than myself, I realized that there was some, some lovely, you know, of course I asked Baba for help. Was it Baba or was it something else I couldn't say? But I realized that that energy that she had talked about was so negative and so dangerous that for me to get into any kind of battle with it would have been just absolute mistake. And the, the message was imbibe in this love instead because it will, it will do all the work for you. You'll, you will not have to um, attempt to dismantle this from yourself. It's just, this love is so much bigger than any of that darkness. And I, I know that sounds trite to say, I hope it doesn't sound as trite as it sounds coming out of my mouth at this moment, but it was a really profound experience. And it reminded me years ago, someone said to me, um, and she said this 20 years ago, she said, in the future, the world is going to become more and more and more divided. Be very careful to be for something and not against something. Otherwise, you will get wrapped into that, that battle. And I have just found that to be such really true advice on so many levels. And I think for me, when I engage in Remy's poetry, I'm reminded of that, you know, that he understood that so, so clearly. As did obviously Baba, who reminds us in many ways. Great. Yeah. Can I read a poem? What, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> this is called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them all at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond. Hmm. Thank you, Ken. It's my It's one of my favorite Rumi poems. I didn't know that, but it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, we've read that here many times because it's just so incredible. It's so exactly what we were talking about. 
Yeah, and I thank you for that. Never gets old. Who else has that Romy Pond they'd like to, to read? I could read a short one. Yeah, we knew <laughs> you had one. It's okay. In your light, I learn how to love. In your beauty, how to make poems. You dance inside my chest where no one sees you. But sometimes I do. And that sight becomes this art. Can, can you read it again? Sure. In your light, I learn how to love in your beauty how to make poems you danced inside my chest where no one sees you but sometimes i do and that sight becomes this art <laughs> Mm -hmm. Ken, are you raising your hand? You're you're on mute. No, I wasn't raising my hand. I was scratching my ear. Ooh, right then. Shall I, shall I continue? Does someone else have any uh, poem, another Remy poem they'd like to share? Or thoughts or comments about what we've heard so far? I just heard a quote um, by Remy, which um, really wraps up for me how I feel about the word God. He said, I love all the names of God, but the one I love the most is the nameless one. Whatever the ways of the world, what fruits do you bring? Say famine strikes, no bread or bowl of rice in the land, royal in rank, royal heart. Where is your hand? Where is your measuring cup and storehouse of grain? Say earth and sky fall into adultery, all of us on our knees worshiping figurines. Where is the idol noble and clever enough to break the spell? Say scorpions, thorns, and snakes overrun the world. Even so, you're brimming with joy. Where is your garden? Take us to the flowers. Misers rule. Generosity fades from memory. Still, your eyes see. Your heart is full. What wage will you pay? What clothes will you offer the stri stripped and bare? Sun and moon go down in flames. What light will you shine? What fire will you light before we cannot see and before we cannot hear? No mouth to utter love secrets. Where are the silent translations surging from your heart? Dear friend, imagine that you are a jeweler. You have more wealth than you can count. What else would you do but rain down pearls? Let us put this all aside. We are inebriated on a lofty ale and it's getting late. Where, my friend, is your tavern? Take us there. 
Fall love that burns through me and consumes me, you are the friend of my soul. Lift me up. You are spirit, savior, slayer, and the slain. Inside your heart, mysteries stand naked. Press my ear to your chest. You are light, revelry, the road to triumph, the bird from the holy mountain. I am the seed in your beak. Drop and see, sugar and poison, tenderness and rage, rooms flood with sunlight, house of the wandering star, garden of buds about to bloom. You are all of them, dear friend. Let me in. You are day and night, the feast and the fast. You are the harvest of my prayers when I have nothing but hunger, for nothing but grace down on my knees. Water and jug, soak me in your grace. Trap and bait, cup and wine, raw and cooked, don't let me be callow. Don't let me be petty. Don't leave me raw, cook me. Burn me up, I will rise. Restless with longing, my mind and body weave web after web, my own hearts ensnared. When they trust, they stop. The path to you opens without a word. For some reason, this reminds me of something I read by Brene Brown recently. She was talking, there's a book she wrote called Daring Greatly. And it's really about the paradox of vulnerability and leadership and how often it's overlooked or um, undervalued. And that if you don't have some vulnerability in your leadership skills, people won't really trust you and they won't follow you. Um, and um, because they're well, people won't know how to have the hard conversations. They won't know how to address the difficulties and they'll gloss over them. And um, she was talking about how um, so often when she's called into leadership situations to help them, she sees that that's happening, that there's been an isolation that happens. And she said something that really struck me. Um, she said, People who isolate don't want to be alone. They just do it because they don't trust. They, it's safer to be alone than to be with other people. And it really struck me very hard that um, what Remy's talking about, that bridge building, is something that can be so scary. I saw myself sharp as a thorn. I fled to the softness of petals. I saw myself sour as vinegar. I mixed myself with sugar. An aching eye seen through pain, a stewing pot of poison. I was both. Reaching for the antidote, I touched mercy and compassion. I was a cup holding only dregs. I poured in the water of life. Raw and shallow, I followed the ones already cooked by love's fire. In the dirt on love's path, I found the medicine that ensouls sight. Armor thinned to a silken scrim, I shifted the soil that gives vision to the blind. Love said, yes, You've arrived, but don't think it's your doing. I'm the wind, you're the fire. I stoke your flames. Sun and moon of mine, you've come. My sight, my hearing, you've come. Ecstasy, you've come. Eyes filled with sun, harvest of my own longing, you've come. Desert, bandit, penance breaker, silver moon beloved, you've come. 
lantern in hand, I searched for you last night. Today, you are the path, a bouquet of unfolding flowers. Anyone, any comments? I have a comment, but it was from a poem about 30 minutes ago. Oh, yeah. Um, it had used the word tumbler in it, in it. Do you remember that one? Yeah, the tumbler, the locks. So that you are the key, we are the tumblers in the lock. Yeah. So I love, that line. I love that line. It really stood out to me. And I wondered, because yeah. it's all translation. Yeah if other people translated it with that, because it's such a fabulous visual. Yes. And is that from gold from? No, that was a com that was from this one. Oh. Bridge of Salt by Common Morris. And have you ever looked at the difference between like what Coleman Barks does yes. and what the woman from gold does? Yes, I actually spent quite a bit of time trying to find her poems and compare them to Coleman Barks, but she did not, she didn't give titles to her poems, so it was almost impossible. He actually didn't give titles to his poems either. So Coleman Barks just uses this as an effect because it's what we sort of expect. Um, but yeah, I actually was trying to do that. I was actually trying to pick them out and compare them and I couldn't find any that were, you know, that were the same poem. So I'm sure someone has done that somewhere, but I've, I've never been able to find it. AI, where are you now? It would be fascinating. <laughs> it would be so fascinating to do it. I know that when I was learning German, I bought a book of Goethe, Johann Goethe, who was my favorite poet and writer until I discovered Hafez. And I, I actually, his name was Johann Goethe. I actually felt like I needed to write him a um, metaphorical letter and say, dear John, it's been great. I found somebody new. His name is Hafez. I will always love you. I'm just not that into you. I'm just, it's over. <laughs> but then it turned out that Goethe was so in love with Hafez that he considered him his, his twin brother. And I was like, oh, I'm just in love with two brothers. I'm good. But um, I, when I was learning German and I lived in Germany, I had a book of, of German, uh, of Goethe. It was a German on one page and English on the other. And so I would learn all these, you know, ridiculous words that had nothing to do with how to find a bathroom, like, you know, doppelganger and um, words like that. But German people were so fascinated that I would use these words that clearly most English speaking people didn't learn, that they would immediately want to see the book. And it was fascinating because Goethe is so loved in, in German, just so, so very loved, that they would have these really big discussions about what the words meant because there it was in English and there it was in German. And it really helped me understand the impossibility of translating poetry, just the absurdity of it. But we have to try because where would we be if we couldn't read, you know, Rumi in English or, or Hafez or, or, you know, so many fabulous writers. So, um, because every word in a poem is actually significant. And that's why it's so impossibly hard. Thanks for asking that question, Diane. I appreciate it. I think a lot of people, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people sort of um, speak, you know, despairingly about Coleman Barks because he's not a Farsi speaker, <clears throat> but he was a scholar. He, well, he's still alive. He, he's, he is a scholar. You know, he has a PhD in, um, in English and um, really has devoted his whole life to making these translations. But the thing I guess I want to say about it is, um, you know, when he was in Afghanistan and Iran, people were confronting him, like, what gives you the right to translate 
our beloved Rumi. You're not, you're not a Farsi speaker. And he would just share with them that, you know, he was called to do this work. He actually had a vision as a, as a young man. He, he, someone poured all this love over him. He didn't understand what it meant. Later, he met that person in real life. He, that man became his Sufi teacher. And that man was really helping him, as I think we can all feel in Farish Tay's work that Baba's hand is, is on her work. Um, I was recently, you know, giving a talk about the Native American photographs I've made. And I was kind of confronted by that, by a inebriated Native woman. You know, she was sort of challenging me, well, what right do you have to photograph Native people? And I, and I, I didn't, because she was inebriated, I didn't feel like it made sense to explain myself, but the truth is I felt called to do that work. And um, I just want to say that because I think so often we get this message in life that, that there's something that we, are, that we are meant to do. And then we question ourselves about it and we think, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not enough, I'm not worthy. And I, I just know how hard I question myself um, about that, you know, calling to work, to photograph Native people, to interview Native people, to, to be a bridge with Native people. Um, and, um, you know, an elder sat me down one day because I confessed to him that I couldn't figure out why. I was like, why me? You know, I'm from Georgia. I'm from Augusta, Georgia. We don't, we don't have any Native people in Augusta, Georgia. You know, I grew up not knowing Native people. And um, he just said, you know, just said, well, you really have to just trust that you are exactly who you were meant to be. And I'm so grateful for Coleman Barks to do, that he did that. Um, I'm sure he got a lot of flack about it from a lot of people. Um, and I don't know why I want to share that story, but I do. But he does not speak Farsi? He does, he does not speak Farsi. So he, how, how does one translate a language they don't? Takes, he, he works with a Farsi speaker who translates them literally and then Coleman Barks will work, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, this word um, loves flame. No, it meant love's fire. Oh no, it meant love's ember. No, it meant love's light. And they will go back and forth about, is it, what, was it flame? Was it light? Was it ember? Was it spark? You know, and then they'll, they'll really break that down into a way that they feel grasps at the essence of the, the or the gist of the meaning. So um, I know that he spent most of his life doing that. Um, I mean, after, after work, in Athens, Georgia, where I went to school, um, he would go to this little cafe and, and work on those and worked on them for years. And um, if you think about Rumi's poetry, you know, he says things, I think Baba says this as well. A lot of people say this in such a beautiful way. Uh, you can read this in the Bible, actually. Um, you know, if you, you may have the power to move a mountain and to say to that mountain jump and the mountain jumps, but if you do not have love, you are a tinkling brass and a noisy cymbal. And I just think it's, some, there's something to be said about that, that if we are doing an action with love, that it, it automatically has a grace, it has an inspiration, it has a life force that's bigger than us. And when we do it without love, which so often we find ourselves doing, then it's a little bit of an empty form. I guess I'm sort of defending Coleman Barks. I guess that part of the story that I'm trying to say <laughs> is that I think he, his work really deserves our respect because clearly it was done with a great passion and a great love. I actually think you're um, def not even defending, but explaining why someone who does not have the bo outside box one would expect reaches over and becomes an ally. Yes. Yes, he has become an ally for me. Uh, totally, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. You know, when we do something without love, what's the effect? When we do something with love, what's the effect? Because there's such different effects.
I think our work here is done. <laughs> Always so fun to share poetry with this group, even if it is a small group. I know people who listen to them afterwards. I've had lots of people tell me that they listen to them. I know that um, when I'm doing something with my hands, it's one of the things I love, love, love to do is just to turn on some poetry and listen to it. it just makes me so happy to just you know do an action with my hands while listening to poetry. I feel just like I'm literally sort of stepping into this ecstatic cloud that I'm being invited to. When do we get invited to ecstatic clouds? <laughs> Kelly, it's so nice to see you. And even, even better, if that's the appropriate way to say it, to hear you read poetry. So, I know. Yeah. Well, thank and you. I can. I'm Diane, and this is Terry. I can. Agreed. Uh, in the latest. Uh, hi, Kelly. Hi. Okay. Hey. It's it's been really beautiful. Thank you so much, Jamesy.